Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our meeting. Great to have councillors and staff here, together with members of the public who are joining us both in person and online. In officially opening the meeting at one o'clock, we acknowledge and respect Tasmanian Aboriginal peoples as the state's first peoples and recognise them as the traditional owners and continuing custodians of the land and waters of this land, Lutruwita, Tasmania, on which we work, learn and live. We pay our respects to all Tasmanian Aboriginal communities, all of whom have survived invasion, dispossession and continue to maintain their identity and culture. We also acknowledge Elders past and present. Please be seated. We've got two councillors who are on leave, the Mayor, Councillor Van Zetten and Councillor Stosinczyk, and an apology from Councillor Cox. A reminder that the meeting is being recorded, so if we could ensure that our mobile devices are switched to silent or off, that would be appreciated. There are no mayoral acknowledgements at point two. Declarations of interest, point three. Do any councillors have any pecuniary or conflict of interest in respect to any matters appearing on the agenda? There being none, we move to item four, the confirmation of the minutes of the meeting held on the 30th of June. Someone to move. Thank you, Councillor Harris. A seconder, Councillor Spencer. All those in favour, please raise their hand. That is all councillors present. The motion is carried unanimously. We move to item five, council workshops. 5.1. Workshop report. Someone to move. Thank you, Councillor Soward. A seconder, Councillor Dawkins. Do you wish to speak to the motion, Councillor Soward? Councillor Dawkins. Do any councillors wish to speak to the workshop report? There being no contributions, we'll take the vote. All those in favour? That is all councillors present. The motion is carried unanimously. Item 6, councillors' leave of absence applications will be dealt with uh, at uh, closed council, as listed there. We now move to item 7 on the agenda, community reports. Our first community report today comes from Roy Scarbo, a member of the Australian Plant Society Northern Group Reserves Conservation Committee. We're sorry that your fellow speaker, Mr Dale Luck, is unwell and not able to join you, but we look forward to hearing from you. Thanks. I can't hear you as well, I can't hear you as well here as I could there. <laughs> oh, is, that, is that okay? Thank you, thank you very much. Yes, Dale, Dale unfortunately, is, uh, has got COVID. I'm here to represent the Australian Plant Society of Tasmania Northern Group. Uh, our group intends to get more involved in the conservation of our native flora. And we have set up a committee to get this underway. Because many of our members are Launceston ratepayers, we decided our first approach should be to the city of Launceston rather than a neighbouring uh, council. We would like to offer our time and skills to the city of Launceston for the maintenance of our precious bushland reserves like Carvilla, uh, Cambridge Street and Havelock, Street, Havelock Reserve. Although council officers try to uh, look after these bushland areas, it's very clear that many of them are suffering deterioration of their natural values, mainly due to the incursion of weeds from outside the area. Our members are interested in working with council officers to help implement the management plans which were written many years ago for the reserves. These management plans stress that an important objective for the establishment of reserves, of the bushland reserves, is to maintain biodiversity and the natural values of the areas. Doing this properly can be very, very time consuming and therefore very expensive. But with help from knowledgeable volunteers, it can be done effectively and cheaply. There are many ways we can help. The most effective way is the formation of a friends group for one or more of the reserves. Our members have a very good track record in the formation and management of such groups. For example, Punchbowl Reserve, 
Trevallan Nature Recreation Area and Machen's Reserve. We would like to offer guided walks into the reserves when the wildflowers are at their best. This demonstrates to local residents and others, including perhaps councillors, <laughs> Uh, that how impressive and valuable these uh, reserves are. We can do things like collecting seeds in the reserves and propagate from the seeds to provide plants of local provenance to re-vegetate the reserves, important point. Um, we can conduct surveys of the plant species in the reserves and help track the natural values of the reserves over time. All this can be done at zero to minimal, zero or minimal cost to the city of Launceston. What we need eventually is a memorandum of understanding between us and the city of Launceston to define how we would operate and what help we might provide. Several years ago, when we were starting up a friends group for Punchbowl and also for Machen's Reserve, we had enthusiastic support from the city of Launceston, from their officers. Unfortunately, they have now moved on or retired. We are asking councillors to encourage your current officers to take advantage of our offer, to provide expert advice and potentially thousands of hours of free volunteer uh, assistance for the maintenance of our bushland reserves. Because the best time to start a friends group is uh, October, November, when the flower, flowers are at their peak, uh, we would like to get uh, moving very quickly. While a memorandum of understanding might take some time, perhaps weeks to write, um, and um, a, letter, a letter from Council uh, supporting um, our, our participation, our future participation, would be uh, very handy in the short term, and um, it would enable us to uh, join the Australian Plant Society, it being us, to, to join Landcare Tasmania, uh, establish a Landcare group, and take advantage of Landcare's um, insurance um, premium. So lots of advantages for that, but we do need to move quickly. <laughs> oh, that's it. <laughs> Roy, thanks so much for your presentation today. And just in terms of the process, the correspondence has been received and we'll ensure that we formally respond um, to that letter. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Well, today, we not only have one community report, but indeed we have two. So uh, we're going to welcome Jackie Ann Philandis, the organiser of the Launceston Ukulele Jamboree, to share with us about that event. Welcome, Jackie. Thank you very much, Danny. It's Anna Fandis. Everyone pronounces it wrong, but that's OK. <laughs> I'm um, Jackie. I've, uh, I'm the organiser of the Launceston Ukulele Jamboree. So I've been a, a ukulele teacher and community jam facilitator for the last four years. Um, I'm really passionate about sharing my love of music and the uh, joy it brings and the emotional well-being benefits of community music to everyone in the community that has never particularly thought of themselves as musical. It's such a um, lovely, joyous, collaborative thing to be part of, community music. So I've been watching the exponential growth overseas and around Australia of ukulele uh, festivals, ukulele-themed festivals, and thought Launceston could do with something like this. We've got a, a strong history of folk festivals and blues festivals in Tasmania. They're generally in uh, far-flung reaches of Tassie and you have to travel to get to them. I've never had time to go to, say, the um, Signet Folk Festival. I watch it every year and I've never had time to go there because I've been too busy. Putting something right in the heart of Launceston not only um, attracts Launceston residents, but uh, people from all around Tasmania. So. Last year I um, put in my very first grant application through your wonderful small events grant program, which is very, very worthwhile. Thank you so much from the arts community for having this as part of your uh, commitment to the community. I was successful in my very first grant application, put on the first event at the Royal Oak Hotel in March 2021, uh, capacity of 80, and we sold out months in advance. So this year, I thought we need to go even bigger. So we went to the Boathouse Function Centre, again in the Launceston surrounds, and we sold out. It was 140 people. And at that point, I thought the one-day format is just too limiting. So next year's plans, I plan to be right in the centre of Launceston CBD, a multi-day, whole weekend event, 
free community events, ticketed workshops. So the, the Jamboree format is a combination of um, concert, so that's um, showcasing professional ukulele-themed musicians and bands, and then you have the workshops where participants can learn a new skill. Then you have the play-along segments where everyone gets to join in with a, a professional band, a play-along and sing-along. And open mic where participants get to stand up in front of a captive audience and strut their stuff. So it's really inclusive and, and caters to, to multitude skill levels. Um, <clears throat> so the demographics that come to the Jamboree, um, over 50% of participants for the last two events have been from outside of the Launceston region, which is great. So we've had people from the west coast, down south of Hobart, northwest coast. It, it's a real draw card. It, um, and around Australia, there's a, a strong community of travellers who just love travelling around, going to all of these quirky uke festivals. So my aim is to build this event each year, and I'm, I'm watching what happens overseas and picking the eyes out of ideas. Had a lovely Zoom meeting with um, two of the organisers of the massive Melbourne Ukulele Festival just recently, and they, they were so generous and gave me a heap of information about pricing and costing and um, sourcing uh, sponsorship from, from the business community. And they were really lovely. And, and, and each year I'm growing and twerking and tweaking, not twerking, <laughs> tweaking my, my uh, business model to, uh, to grow this event into, into something that Launceston can be proud of and will draw travellers from all around Australia. Uh, so for next year's event, I've already had um, applications of interest from some mainland performers who are very well known around the, the Australian ukulele festival circuit. I had a, um, a luthier and performer from New Zealand who's keen to come over. So all of these um, little add-ons that we create each year is going to grow more interest in, and put Launceston firmly on the map for travellers to come to the ukulele festival. So thank you so much for for your lovely grants program. It's vitally important to uh, support our, our local arts community. We're really appreciative of you. Thank you so much. Thanks, Jackie. All the best with the upcoming event. Thank you. Item eight is public question time. The responses at 8.1 and 8.1.2 um, are included in the agenda. We now move to 8.2, which is public questions without notice. Mr Baines, you just state your name and address for the record. Ron Baines, um, Kings Meadows, rate payer. How much of the $9 million that Council borrowed for the CH Smith project has been paid back? Is it still owing? And it's still owing on that project? Mr Gimble. Thanks, Acting Mayor. Yes, we paid the entire nine million back in February 22. Sorry, I, I can't year. actually hear you. That must be a, a, a right. no, poor quality it. microphone. This one's pretty good. We, we paid it back in February this year. It's all paid back. All of it, the Wonderful. Million, That's yep. Good stuff. And, and the next question you may be able to answer too. And was the income from that project what actually covered that loan or, or did council have to take extra monies out of its other finances project? No, we, we used that for the capital purchase of the building but we, and, and of course the loan itself was interest free, well, reimbursed by the state government. So whatever we charge, we invoice them and they pay it back to us. So in, in that sense, we, we didn't have to pay any interest at all. Thank you. Thanks very much. Cheers. Last question. Has council managed to make a decision re-removal of the remaining thylacine statues and using them elsewhere in Launceston in order to, to cover its duty of care to the citizens of Launceston. It's, 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 been almost, it's been about a year since I first asked this question, so I'm hopeful to get a response. Thanks, Mr Baines. Uh, Mr Ryan? Good afternoon, Mr Baines. Um, our placemaking team are continuing to work through some alternative options on where we can position those, uh, those statues to find a suitable location. We are very close to finalising that now. All right, thank you. Thanks very much. Oh, one last thing. Uh, uh, I, 
The council has suggested that I might be better singing at these meetings rather than asking questions. So if, if, if that's um, what you'd like, just let me know and I'll send you a song list. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, Mr Baines. Are there any other questions? No, it's all right. Good afternoon, everyone. Get my glasses on. Uh, my just, questions relate... So, sorry, I, I know we know you, but just for the record and the recording... Oh, yes, Sue Rafferty, Vermont. Um, my questions relate to the MTM building in Invermay Road, Mowbray. Question one, uh, asbestos removal from the sites currently underway. What tender process was undertaken to remove asbestos from the MTM site? And if there was no tender process, why not? CEO, would you be happy to further expand on the agenda? Well, I think I would, I would refer. So that, that question has been answered in the agenda. Um, so if you care to, to have a look at it, item. Um, I don't think, eight, I did have a look. I don't think it was two. directly answered. It, it is. I'll have another look. All right, what costs have been incurred and what costs are anticipated in total? CEO, are you able to answer that? Thanks, Acting Mayor. So the, the tender amount was for 681000 um, so to date, there's been 50% of those that, that fee has been paid, so that's 340000 So the balance is expected to be paid at the end of this month. OK. As a Northern Suburbs resident and ratepayer, I wish to know how the asbestos waste was contained when transported following removal. I've heard some stories about this, so I'm very interested in it and whether the Mowbray Heights Primary School were notified that hazardous waste was being removed in the direct vicinity of the school. Before I get the CEO to respond, I think it's important to note that they are a qualified asbestos um, remover. I so understand that. CEO. Thanks, Acting Mayor. So, no, I would refer to the same. Obviously, they're qualified and accredited to be able to undertake the work. Um, the project manager did engage with all of the state, all of the neighbours around the um, around the site um, prior to it commencing. So, again, I've heard differently. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good day, everyone. Thank you for being with us. Are there any further questions from the public? No, I don't think so. Thank you. Under the provisions of the Land Use Planning and Approvals Act 1993, Council acts as a planning authority in regard to items included in Agenda Item 9, Planning Authority. The first is 9.1, 120A Invermay Road, change of use to consulting rooms. I've got uh, a speaker, Talitha. Speakers uh, have two minutes to speak for or against. If you just state your name and address. Hello, welcome. Hi, uh, my name is Talitha. I'm from St Leonard's and uh, M from Newnham is speaking with me. Great. We're best friends, so we do everything together. Thanks, thanks for having us. Um, so as Taz has said, hi, my name is Emily. This is Taz. We are the founders of Futures Isle who are making this application. We started our business two years ago in the middle of a pandemic because we had a desire to see people supported to thrive in regions, especially ours. So our business, Futures Isle, is focused on helping people, places and organisations take the next step. And we do this through facilitation, programs, mentoring and consulting. We also just hired our first full-time employee two weeks ago for a hit. Um, we've absolutely loved the projects that we've worked on so far. We've worked with UTAS, uh, City Mission, the Royal Flying Doctor <laughs> Service, um, as well as the Special Games Launceston, which is happening later this year. Um, the Local Jobs Program, the Tasmanian Department of Education and the ABC. So um, now we're ready to take our next step and move out of my back bedroom uh, and into an <laughs> office to commence delivery. Um, we're super excited because we're commencing delivery of the City Deal Supported Entrepreneurship Facilitators Program for the next three years. So we want to make 120A Invermay Road our home um, because we see a lot of potential in the building and the space. Um, also because I grew up in the northern suburbs and uh, also because we wanted to show people that really great things can happen outside of the CBD um, and we want to be a one-stop shop for potential future pathways. 
Most of our work involves one-to-one -one mentoring meetings, uh, which we're planning on using the front of the building as it's the warmest spot. And um, our events and workshops will be held in the back space. These are gonna be for small business owners, people looking for support and the local community. The workshops are focused on building confidence, um, starting businesses, finding employment, growing community and networking people, um, all of which partner with you in economic development support. So we know that there might be a little bit of noise from our neighbours, but we feel really comfortable with that. Um, we're not stuffy office people. We like places that are alive and bustling. Um, and the other awesome thing about this particular venue is it gives us the space to do the things that we would really like to do, but also it's really accessible from a public transport perspective. Um, there's a bus stop just 100 metres away, which is fantastic for our purposes. It has 89 buses a day, which we're pretty excited about. Um, we wanted to thank you so much for your time and consideration and the work that you do. We're looking forward to working with you extensively over the next coming years and supporting our region the best as we can, hopefully in 128 in the May Road. Thank, Thank you, you Talitha and Emily. Are there any other speakers with regard to item 9.1? Great, thank you. Moved Councillor McKenzie, a seconder. Councillor Spencer. Councillor McKenzie, do you wish to speak to the item? Yes, thanks Acting Mayor. Uh, look, I'm delighted to see somebody with so much enthusiasm about what they do and what they're trying to achieve. Um, this DA only requires two discretions and that's retail impact and uh, car parking, and I think they've all been adequately addressed in the, in the report from the officers. Clearly, the major angst are the businesses. It's almost a bit reverse of what we normally hear, uh, is where the businesses who they, in the area where they're moving into are actually concerned about the noise they're making and going to be putting back in the impact that it'll have on that business. As indicated by the speakers, uh, they're happy to have noise around them. Uh, they like the sort of thought of life going on around them, and I think that's fine provided down the track uh, the protections are in place for those businesses that already exist in the light industrial area. So I'll sit down with a question and just querying the issue in relation to noise created once we approve this application, the ability of the, uh, the proponents to then go back and say we don't like the noise that's going on around us as to how we actually support uh, the decision we're making today in legislation. Thanks, Councillor McKenzie. Uh, Town Planner Ian, are you able to answer that? Sorry, I wasn't sure if that was a question. Um, I think um, you're just curious about in the future if, if it's considered there is too much noise. Look, in the commercial zone, um, noise really only takes into consideration your sensitive use. So. What you're looking at is if your surrounding residential uses, it doesn't necessarily take into consideration um, any potential businesses operating. Um, in saying that, if there were complaints, there would be, we'd be limited, I guess, by, by what we could actually do under the planning scheme, um, and then it might come in, in through um, a health pathway, so under EMPCA. Thank you so much. Seconder, Councillor Spencer. Thanks, Deputy. Yeah, I've checked that out today. Um, I've worked at a couple of them uh, workshops next door. They do make a little bit of noise, but um, it's good that these people realise that. Um, their main meetings have stated are going to be after school hours, so the parking should not be a problem. Um, during school hours, it is pretty busy outside that school. They've stated that their main meetings will be after school hours, so the parking will not be an issue. So I'll fully support it. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Spencer. Councillor Soward. Thanks, Acting Mayor. I um, too rise to support uh, the remarks made by Councillor McKenzie and Councillor Spencer and just wanted to touch on a couple of points. Um, when we sit as a planning authority, we deal with matters under the planning scheme, so um, notwithstanding what you know, you know, particular businesses might go in there, that, that's by and large not uh, part of it. That said, when I read through this application, it certainly is something I'm very, very comfortable with. Um, and uh, again, uh, the question I was going to ask was the one that Councillor McKenzie asked around um, the people moving into this, if this is approved, dealing with the noise and being happy with that, which has been answered. Uh, and whilst it does sit outside, what I'm going to say does sit outside the scheme, it's just delightful to hear people with such a positive, uh, enthusiastic um, view and excitement around doing something in our city. 
and I think they need to be commended for it. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Soward. Are there any other contributions? Councillor Walker has a question. Thank you, uh, Chair. Um, if I could ask um, the planner again in regards to the, the noise issue, I suppose there's different scenarios that you could paint. For example, we change uh, this particular uh, use at the moment, but then uh, a, a new operator comes in and takes over at some point and does complain about the noise, for example. Um, I know we mentioned that this is a commercial zone, but then I've also heard uh, light industrial being mentioned and also residential from the planner. So, so the two questions, I suppose, are what is the configuration of zoning in that area? And um, I, I understand he's already argued, uh, argued answered that, um, you know, that, that those issues of noise can only be dealt with as, as, they, as they appear. You can't make a planning decision based on noise that you don't know is going to be a problem. That's understandable, but that second point being, um, you know, that once we approve this, are we inviting you know, a, a, a future problem, I suppose, as in we don't control who uses it and, and, and um, different operators might have different expectations, I suppose. Does that uh, change of, of use continue once it's been made? Thanks, Councillor Walker. Yes. Town planner, Ian. Um, so the, the site's uh, sort of uh, strated commercial zone. Um, I know it, it has that sort of light industrial feel to it. Um, that's just because they're, they're permissible uses within the zone. Just like a business and professional services, which, which we're looking at today, it's a permissible use, which means the zone allows for it um, and allows it to occur. Um, I guess, again, with, with the noise, it's, it's a sort of, as you've said, we, you, you can't say, well, because I guess noise isn't a consideration of, of the decision that, that you'll need to make today. Um, noting, though, that there is a lot of discussion about it. Um, but I guess, again, in the future, um, it, it really depends on the operator. It, it depends, you know, next door could change, for example. It could change into something noisy, um, and we'd only be limited and being able to assess that against um, that impact on a sensitive use, which would be surrounding residential use, not your immediate next door. And I guess that's where, if there were any future complaints, we would have to start looking at EMCA um, and, and any potential, um, I guess, compliance concerns. We would have to go through that, that pathway. Thanks, Ian. Councillor Walker, would you like to speak or another question? Uh, to speak, please. Thank you, Mayor. Sure. Acting Mayor. Um, those concerns that have been raised, I think everyone would understand, are quite reasonable. If you have a motorcycle workshop, it's only fair to assume that at certain times you are going to make a fair amount of noise. Um, and that can be disruptive to the type of use that's being proposed here. So there is that potential for conflict. And I fully understand, and I hope I've elucidated, that I understand that this decision today is not based on the potential for noise that at the moment we don't know about, but I'm wanting to acknowledge those concerns that have been raised by the neighbours in the area. And, of course, everyone here would also want, and I hope including the neighbours, to have congenial relationships uh, with, with their neighbours in this area, in this commercial area, where there are many permitted users, quite a, quite a few of which do make noise, quite a few of which do probably require a certain uh, uh, amount of, of quietness, you know, if, if it's a sales room or whatever it might be. You're not wanting to be... Uh, interrupted by too much noise. So there, there is a conflict there, and it is um, the, the, my concern that the, 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 the permitted uses at the moment, I suppose, may be more congenial uh, than uh, to, to, you know, to the general uh, uses in the area, than this wonderful enterprise, and no one doubts that for a second, uh, this wonderful enter enterprise that's being proposed. Um, it was really refreshing to hear that presentation and to see that there are people out there uh, looking for new opportunities and um, new ways um, of, of uh, providing that type of facilitation. So, having said all that, I wonder, is, is this... Um, obviously not the only area that they could have set up their business, but, but they, this is a place that they've chosen for... 
uh, the, the reasons that they outlined. Um, and you can see on many levels that, that it does fit uh, very well. Its location, uh, there is a, a, a retail aspect to what they're doing, I suppose, um, a, a showroom, if you like, um, aspect to what they're doing uh, and what they're presenting <coughs> to the public. Um, I am concerned, as I'm sure everyone is, that, that we are potentially setting up a situation here that could be um, a source of some uh, conflict. So I, I'd like to be reassured more, um, but I am tending towards supporting um, the development application today because I can see that certainly these uh, operators are going to be uh, they're, they're aware going in with their eyes wide open as to where they are setting up their business. They want to be a part of a, a vibrant um, atmosphere in that way. I just sincerely hope um, that this doesn't sort of turn around and become an issue um, because, um, you know, that, that you do have these... the stretching of the mixed use, I suppose, within our planning system. I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Walker. Councillor Daking. Thank you, Acting Mayor. I'd most like to congratulate the, application, the applicants. Um, it's fantastic to see different businesses going to that particular area. And work together, I think, is a very positive sign that we've got a mix of different businesses together. And those businesses next door and along in the area could become future um, clients of this new business. So I think it's a great sign. I'm very supportive and um, I congratulate them and I hope it gets by the three. Thanks, Councillor Daking. Are there any further contributions? Councillor McKenzie, do you wish to close? Well, just briefly, I mean, I think the important thing is it is planning consideration we're making today. There are two discretions that have been used. They've been adequately dealt with in the submission by the, uh, uh, by the planner. Um, I agree the noise issue could be an issue, but it's going to be an issue regardless of that at some stage in the future if somebody has a different view about the noise levels and they'll have to be dealt with under MCA. Thank you, Councillor McKenzie. We'll put the motion to the vote. All those in favour, raise their hand. That is all councillors present. The motion is carried. We now move to 9.2, page 36 of the agenda. Uh, one more shared street, pun Mooreshead Street punch bowl, residential construction of an additional dwelling. I have no speakers listed, Daniel, is that correct? Thank you, great. So looking for someone to move the motion, please. Thank you, Councillor Harris. Seconder. <laughs> Councillor Spencer. They're all scrolling to page 36. Uh, Councillor Harris, would you like to speak to the motion? Thank you, Mayor. Yes, we are all scrolling to page uh, 36 of our agenda. Um, this is an interesting um, application coming before us. Uh, often when we have an uh, infill development application of a, by fundamentally a unit being built behind an existing house, the major concern comes from the fact that what's being proposed is in fact two storey and people are overshadowed and people worried about the uh, lack of privacy in their backyard. <coughs> This is a uh, single-storey, two-bathroom, uh, two three-bedroom unit, or house, really, on an 873-square-metre block of land and uh, really lends itself quite well to being developed in this particular manner. Um, there are an, a few discretions regarding parking um, and also, uh, I think, the driveway width as well. But other than that, the... Uh, Discretion's been required of us after some uh, discussion had gone on between the proponent and uh, those around it, which has resulted in a slightly lower roof line being proposed in an amended plan. Um, this actually seems to me to be quite a, a very good development for uh, the punch bowl area. And in fact, um, the, as many of those who came on site today noted that the whole uh, punch bowl area is in fact very well located, being so close to Kings Meadows as well as the city, um, and at the time that it was developed after the First World War, the land sizes are quite generous, and so I think we will see this type of development uh, 
again in this particular uh, suburb. So to me, this is a, a good development that deserves our support today. I do understand the residents' concerns, uh, but whenever anything changes, people are always concerned. But I do feel that what is proposed here today is something that will in fact add to the amenity of the uh, neighbourhood um, and not detract too much from those who are around it, but nevertheless it will be a change. And so therefore I encourage my fellow councillors to support this development application today. Thank you, Councillor Harris. Seconder, Councillor Spencer. Thanks, Acting Mayor. Uh, yep, I will definitely support this. Um, it's good to see neighbours work in when there's a bit of a problem. They work together and resolve the issues. That's great to see. There should be more of it. Um, I was a bit concerned about the parking, but uh, the officers have told me in front of the rear new property there's enough room for an extra three or four cars on the driveway without affecting the front property. So I'll fully support it. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Spencer. Any other contributions to 9.2? Councillor Walker. Thank you, Chair, and um, I too will support this. I'd like to think, and I might be sort of stroking my own ego here, that um, talking a little bit about, um, you know, people building double-storey properties, in uh, duplexes, if you like, um, on strata title in, in backyards as a part of, um, you know, the growing uh, development in our city, um, has been questioned by some, and I'm not to know in this particular case at all, but I do appreciate the fact that this is a single-storey building. Um, I appreciate the fact that the, uh, the, the developer and our council officers have worked with those who uh, have had objections to the development uh, to find amenable solutions. This is the type of development that can uh, sit in uh, within a small uh, community of residential dwellings and not have a significant impact on the amenity of those people surrounding it. And so I do commend uh, the process and um, I will be supporting this development application. Thank you, Councillor Walker. Nice moment of personal reflection there. Any other contributions? Councillor Harris, do you wish to close? I don't think there's anything more to add, thank you. We'll put the vote. All those in favour, raise their hand. That is all councillors present. The motion is carried unanimously. Council no longer sits as a planning authority. We move to item 10, 10.1, Mayor's announcements. I'd like to um, start, first of all, by thanking all councillors for their support over the last couple of weeks. It's been appreciated. I'd also like to let you know that today was the unveiling of our public realm at the University um, in Bresk site in terms of the community garden and the activity space. And it was just wonderful to be there this morning and to see uh, a variety of community members already taking great advantage of the, the sport facilities, the wall, the table tennis, the, the bouldering wall, the, um, the courts, obviously, and then uh, the community garden. Uh, so I'd like to thank those members of our university reference working group who have worked really hard to ensure that those outcomes for our whole community have been front and centre, because I believe, and I think you will too, when you see it, that the infrastructure that's there will transform that, uh, that part of the precinct and enable all members of our Launceston community to... Uh, to make good use of the facilities that are there. Two items I wanted to expand upon in the Acting Mayor's announcements. The first, obviously, was the uh, NAIDOC week flag raising that occurred on Monday the 4th of July. As always, a really outstanding event and to include young people uh, who were there, who delivered a wonderful um, welcome, was so special. And uh, it was wonderful, I think, it, you know, there, there is this feel that the tide is turning and the diversity of attendees, the very large crowd, uh, are, are willing and wanting for uh, great understanding and uh, reconciliation to occur. I know a number of councillors were there, including uh, Councillor Preece and Councillor Walker, Councillor Harris and the CEO. Um, so, yeah, really, really fantastic. 
and I know some of you enjoyed lunch there as well. And the second one that I wanted to uh, expand upon were events that occurred on Monday the 11th and Tuesday the 12th, our inaugural volunteering lunches, two subscribed events that our community development staff put together to acknowledge the incredible work of over 50 organisations and 300 individuals contributing to our volunteering in our city. And Councillor Walker and Councillor Harris were able to attend one of those lunches and it was just great to have so many passionate, proud people from our community who are contributing so much in attendance. Everyone really appreciated the lunch and were very appreciative to the City of Launceston for recognising their contribution as volunteers. Are there any questions from the Mayor's announcements? There being none, we'll move to item 11, councillor's reports. Are there any councillor reports? Item 12, questions by councillor, councillors. 12.2, questions without notice. Are there any questions without notice? Councillor McKenzie. Just referencing the, um, the uh, presentation by Roar Zabo, what is the process in regards to how we deal with that? We've obviously received correspondence uh, from the friends of. Is this an operational matter or is it coming back for council to ratify that process? CEO. Thanks, Acting Mayor. <coughs> Look, it's an operational matter, so it is being considered um, by the, the relevant people in our parks and reserves area. So I'm not sure how far we are away from a response, but we're working on it. Um, and um, certainly communicate that to Council when, when there's a position that's being formed. Councillor Walker. Yes, and I was going to ask a, a question along a similar line. I suppose today we've had, we have heard from uh, people who wish to volunteer their time and their expertise and service uh, to something that it will be of Council benefit. And of course, as the um, Chair mentioned, uh, we had the community volunteer celebration this week. Um, and it certainly occurred to me that um, there is that opportunity for Council to be able to facilitate more in regards to uh, volunteering, whether it's to just to coordinate um, and direct people, um, you know, in, in, in the appropriate direction. So I suppose my question is to the CEO, do we have um, any explicit policy when it comes to either individuals or groups who wish to volunteer um, or do, uh, uh, you know, service which does affiliate in some way with council property, council services and the like. Thanks, Councillor Walker. CEO. Thanks, Acting Mayor. So that there are existing policies and practices in respect of, to managing volunteers, and we have quite a few volunteers, particularly around the QV MAG, and we already do have some that operate within, you know, in, our, in some of our parks and reserves. So it is an area that we do need to do a lot more work on, as you would appreciate, there are significant issues with respect to leading volunteers, the insurances, the the, um, the issues that sort of go around with, with having them. We certainly welcome the participation, but we do want to make sure that our our governance is properly in order, um, which is the, what we're working through now in terms of that responding to the request that, that we've received. So, Any further questions? There being none, we'll move to 13.1, Notice of Motion, Councillor Preece. Presuming you would like to move the motion, do we have a, a seconder? Thank you, Councillor Dawkins. Councillor Preece. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Let me begin today by acknowledging the fact that our councillors at the City of Launceston demonstrate mutual trust and respect for each other. We have robust discussion and make sure that everyone is heard. This is what has built our council as one of the very best reputationally. We are a professional organisation. The motion that I bring to the table today is not a new motion. It has been put to and won support for at another council meeting by Councillor and Dr Mary Dunham of Waratah Wynyard Council. There are six parts to the motion outlined. 
in the document. I urge listeners of this council meeting to read the background information within Councillor Dunningham's motion, as I'm sure our councillors here around the table have done. The changes requested to the Code of Conduct framework and terms of reference is a bigger conversation than just our council. So this is a request to support that conversation and make the changes happen. It will help to establish a model code of conduct to attract councillors who understand that their role is to be selfless by acting solely in terms of the public interest, having integrity, objectivity, accountability, openness and honesty. It is prescriptive under each of these topics. I'm asking my fellow councillors to support this motion today. It is the best time as we look towards the October elections to send this letter of request to the local government decision to amend the Local Government Act. The changes are needed and should be expected by City of Launceston constituents because currently to be eligible to nominate as councillor there is no need for a police check or a requirement to provide criminal history or a working with vulnerable people card. Yet we are the government that sits closest to the people of Launceston. <coughs> we go into our constituents' homes, sit at family tables or in lounge rooms and talk about issues. We go into schools, we attend community events and we have vulnerable or young people that attend receptions in our council building. The list goes on. By supporting this request for review and strengthening of the Code of Conduct, it is demonstrating our accountability, integrity and leadership. And as per Section 28 of the Local Government Act, Part 1A, representing and promoting the interests of the community. I have left the request, despite the lateness of the year, for the review and change to be made before the, and once again I mentioned the local government at October elections. It has been demonstrated recently in relation to compulsory voting at these elections how quickly change can be brought about. To be a councillor at this table, to do the best work, make the best decisions for our beautiful city, the best city in our wonderful state, it is a privilege and an honour. The motion promotes quality in local democracy. It will be a step to ensure those who come to sit at this table are always the very best. So now I'd like to hand over to my fellow councillors to discuss. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Preece. Seconder, Councillor Dawkins. Uh, thank you. Yes, well, I think it's perfectly reasonable uh, considering the recent commentary around a particular councillor's actions on the northwest coast that a motion like this be brought. Of course, we want to support uh, Councillor Dunningham in, in her quest to clean things up at Waratah Wynyard. Why wouldn't we? A police check, criminal history and working with vulnerable people seems a reasonable start. Um, we can see that one councillor's actions have actually brought ill repute to all councillors, and in fact, Tasmanians, because that story, of course, didn't just sit within Tasmania, it, it travelled because it was a... It was quite the bizarre story to read. And then when the councillor doubled down, I think that was it made difficult by the act, which didn't give an opportunity then for his fellow councillors to speak to him about his actions and ask for there to be a pathway, a proven pathway, to be able to remove somebody who simply does not have the interests of their council and their region at heart. Um, some of the language in this motion I found quite strange. There's a, a sort of a sense of a missionary kind of act of devotion from a councillor. I don't know if that's entirely right. Some of the language from the UK around selflessness, objectivity, accountability, <coughs> I mean, they're all reasonable, but I think there's probably some words that will speak to more of a contemporary councillor. Maybe words around passion and commitment, brave and expansive, open-minded, compassionate, progressive, but with proven capacity to be able to work with a group of people and to bring about change. So whilst we know that there's so much that's good about the work that's done on local councils, we're living in a time where we do need to change. We do need to move. We do need to act quickly because the, the, the incredible pressure on anyone living in this world right now around financial pressures, climate disruption, all of the issues we talk about all the time, we do need people with that progressive mindset. So I support it. I'm open to it. Anybody can check anything of mine. I'm an open book and, and I hope that every councillor here 
and every person standing at the next council election feels the same. Thanks, uh, Councillor Dawkins. Any other contributions? Councillor McKenzie. Thanks, Deputy Mayor. Um, look, I, I rise to support the motion as well. I mean, the circumstances in which we find ourselves being here to talk about it have been most appalling, quite frankly, that we don't have a mechanism to enable uh, councillors to be removed or to remove themselves in circumstances where the issues that prevailed in, uh, in another council occurred. So I guess that in itself has just highlighted the need for a reform. I think the logic of the recommendation in regards to asking the council, asking the local state government to review it, I think is an appropriate process and let's see what comes back out of it and hopefully we can actually get broader change and make it even better by taking that as only the basis to, to make it, to have a look at it. Councillor Walker. Thank you, Chair, and uh, thank you, Councillor Priest, for bringing this motion forward. I think it would make sense to um, all reasonable people that we should have um, such checks and balances um, with a council, with uh, an organisation that leads this community. And, of course, our community is changing. People are no longer... Um, of <coughs> people are being encouraged to speak up when they see wrong. And those, you know, that can be uh, in many and varied situations, uh, you know, whether it's um, in a domestic situation, uh, but whether it's also you know, other, um, other offences that have occurred in people's lives that have had dramatic effect on them as well. People are being encouraged and being supported to stand up and to name those things, and so they should. And so there is, this is a perfect way um, for councils around Tasmania to help that process of people standing up and being able uh, to voice uh, their experiences uh, in situations that have been unsavoury or worse, uh, that have been damaging, that have been abusive. Um, and, and I suppose um, that my only concerns with this particular um, motion um, it goes to something that would, won't be for us to decide, I suppose. But when we talk about criminal history, there are people in our community who do have, um, you know, uh, a certain um, criminal history that doesn't relate to those things that I've talked about. They are people who have made mistakes in life or done things that society, uh, you know, necessarily deem uh, to not be appropriate. It might be uh, a, a, a history of drug use, for example. Now, who decides whether that is an appropriate thing uh, for someone to make a value judgment about whether that person deserves to run for public office? That's not for us to decide. This motion uh, makes it clear that these are things that should be declared, but I suppose I would just iterate that these are not necessarily things that should preclude someone uh, from putting their hand up for public office. They are things that um, should, certainly should be declared and made clear and open and, and there, there should be no um, shame in that if it is something that someone has done that they have paid their time for, that they have repented, that they have moved forward in life. But those, those are difficult decisions. They're not decisions for around this table today. But I just thought it was important to make that distinction because we are part of a democracy and um, the people... Um, have, you know, can earn their right to participate in that democracy. But certainly, when it comes to things that are, uh, have been you know, flagrant uh, personal uh, abuses and insults um, and, and crimes against um, other people um, in a derogatory way, in an abusive way, in a violent way, these are things that the community should know about their, their elected leaders. These are things that... Um, People should know before they vote for these people. Um, and um, they certainly also should be things that, and as I say again, luckily we don't get to decide how this is initiated, but potentially these are things that if people uh, commit while they're in office, um, that they should uh, lose the privilege of representing their community. So I will be supporting this motion today. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Walker. Councillor Soward. Thanks, Deputy. And I too rise to support and commend Councillor Priest on bringing this today. Councillor Priest has highlighted something which, again, when uh, in the words that uh, have been used, 
um, really resonated with me, and it's a, it's a strange little thing. Councillor Proust talked about um, in, in the remarks uh, about attending, for instance, the example was used whilst on council duties attending a, a, an event with children and elderly adults, people that are vulnerable. Um, and it's interesting because in many other um, roles and jobs, you would need a working with vulnerable people card to do that. So to, to pick up that excellent example, if, and I know uh, the deputy you mentioned, councillors that were there, that was all fine, no one needed one of those, but if I wanted to go and coach a junior football team or Councillor Proust wanted to coach a junior soccer team, you've got to have one. So it's just an interesting little anomaly. And then you can take it further. I mean, there's many councillors around this table that are involved in various community groups with younger people, older people. They have to have one. I think from memory, there are two distinctions. I think there's a working with a vulnerable people card as a volunteer and also one as a paid employee working with people. So I think that's a really, really important point that Councillor um, Priest um, makes there, and again, it resonates. Um, uh, some of us here with professional, um, you know, teaching, uh, there's a registration process, I'm sure, Councillor Priest, in your area at the hospital, there's processes people need to go through. So I think what you've proposed here, and uh, uh, leveraging off the excellent work that uh, Deputy Mayor Dunian has done, I think is really, really um, sensible. I also just wanted to finish my remarks by resonating really strongly with your remarks, Councillor Walker. Um, there are often, if you are looking on government websites for government jobs, they might identify certain things that people, if they have a criminal conviction in that area, that that might not be suitable. So, for instance, and I, I really like the example that you use, I would hate to think that there is someone out there who's passionate about their community who might have got caught smoking drugs when they were 19 and now they're 50, that that disqualifies them. I'd also note, um, and I use that example, because attitudes change over time, and I use that one. Um, 20 years ago, people had different approaches. I'm, it's not up to me to say right, wrong, otherwise. That's not what we're discussing today. But I think that idea of someone doing, if you like, doing the crime, doing the time, and all of a sudden, 20, 30 years later, that all of a sudden something that precludes them from doing something. And coming back to my remark about government jobs, um, it tends to relate, from my previous work in the employment sector, it tends to relate to the job at hand. So if, you know, um, I think that's appropriate. But I commend you, Councillor Priest, on bringing that forward. And I also think, again, as I said, without knowing the history of the working with vulnerable people registration, I just find it interesting how whoever has oversight of that how they have missed, if you will, parts of the local government sector with having to do that. And that goes hand in hand with those other things that Councillor Priest has mentioned. So um, police checks, criminal histories, working with vulnerable people registrations, and as well as the other professional things. So I think it's really timely. I also resonate, Councillor Priest, with your remark, and uh, you might have made it tongue in cheek, but I do know you were serious how with some things, things can move really quickly. Uh, you know, uh, the compulsory voting was one. I remember sitting around this table being a strong advocate for it. Oh, we need time, we need time, we need time. Two councils ago, and all of a sudden, bang, it's happened. So I think if they can move so quickly with this, Councillor Bruce, I think uh, they can certainly move quickly with this. And I'll just conclude my remarks, Acting Mayor, by saying that, you know, as great as this is, that... Uh, Waratah Wynyard, Launceston City, other councils are doing this. Would it have been great leadership as part of the work that goes on in that local government space if state parliamentarians could have sat down and said, you know what, how about we have a look at state parliamentarian qualification, local councillor qualification? And I think from memory, as I do conclude, I think really the only thing they look at is things like bankruptcy, I think, from memory. So thanks, Councillor Priest, for bringing it and your passion. And I, uh, again, referencing uh, Deputy Mayor Dunham in, in the work that uh, the leadership that she's displayed on this issue. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Soward. Councillor Spencer. Thanks, Acting Mayor. Um, thanks, Councillor Priest, for bringing this up. Uh, definitely need something doing. Now, if you've got a cr criminal conviction or you get convicted when you're on council, yes. 
you should be gone. Simple as that. That's my opinion. Um, I still agree with Councillor Walker about getting done something 20 years ago. Yes. I know an electrician that went to Pat um, Tower's alkaloids and they wouldn't let him in. And this was 25 years later. When he was 16, he stole a beer glass. That's how strict it is there. They wouldn't let him in. He's a well, his son's a well-known pipe writer. Um, that I will fully support this, but time does heal. But if you get convicted when you're in the office, you shouldn't be there. Simple as that. Thank you. Any other contributions? Councillor Sout, I wonder if you would have the chair for a moment. Councillor Priest, I want to thank you sincerely for bringing this motion forward. And in speaking to it, I want to say that, like me, I know there are many around this table who already have a working with vulnerable person card, and I think that is appropriate. For many of us who work with young people through this council, it is indeed a requirement uh, in taking on those roles, for example, YAG or the Northern Youth Coordinating Committee, etc., that we do have that in place, which is appropriate. I think in item one, uh, absolutely, there is a need to uh, show leadership in this space with regard to a working with a vulnerable person card. And if, like many of the volunteer organisations I work with, the National Police Check, um, which delineates in some instances some of those things that some councillors have spoken about, um, which, which might be seen as, uh, as um, things that, that don't need to be considered. It's my hope that in items two through to six, that the thorough review that is being undertaken with regard to the Code of Conduct will touch on many of those things. It won't hurt to further support a desire from this council to ensure that that's the case. At the recent Local Government Association meeting, um, Matthew Healy, who heads up the division, reinforced a commitment to delivering on the Code of Conduct review once and for all. And I think some of the comments that have been made around this table that it was all well and good to rush through the compulsory voting, but you couldn't even introduce a mandatory working with vulnerable person check at the same time are absolutely uh, valid comments. And they certainly were comments that members of the sector, elected members of the sector, made at the recent AGM. As a Rotarian, I'm required to have a working with vulnerable person card in order to sell sausages at a Bunnings barbecue. It seems ridiculous working with many, many members of our community and you think of the, the homelessness space, the elderly space, the youth at risk space, those with mental health issues. Um, it seems crazy that it isn't built in to our induction, into our requirements of sitting as a member of this local government organisation that we wouldn't at least have to have a working with vulnerable person card, as is the case with any other volunteer organisation in the state. So, Councillor Priest, thank you for the motion. I feel items two through to six add further support to the work of the sector, to the work of Legat and the division. And in item one, whilst I doubt very much it will get up by uh, this time, this, this coming election, it sends a really clear message and adds voice, strong voice, to other local councils around the state that are calling for a similar thing, which is an absolute base requirement to my way of thinking. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. I'll hand the chair back to you. Thanks, Councillor Soward. Councillor Priest, do you wish to close? I do, thank you, Deputy Mayor, Acting Mayor. Um, I would just like to thank um, my fellow councillors very much for their... Um, as usual, um, very respectful and supportive um, conversation around this matter. Um, and I look forward to um, seeing the letter that's sent. Thank you very much, if you vote for this motion. <laughs> Thank you. Councillor Priest, we'll put the motion. All those in favour, please raise their hand. That is all councillors present. The motion is carried unanimously. We now move to item 14.1 as Councillor Harris departs the meeting. 14.1 Heritage Advisory Committee meeting. Someone to move. Thank you, Councillor McKenzie. A seconder, Councillor Walker. 
Do you wish to speak to the motion, Councillor McKenzie? Uh, just briefly, I think that you know, the, the, the depth of what we discussed in the Heritage Advisory Committee meetings, I think, are getting broader and uh, I think getting a lot more value out of the meetings than we probably have for a while in that we're actually getting in depth into about why we do things and why heritage is important and how we can actually work better with council in relation to in making sure that we protect the heritage of the city. And I think uh, the things that we discussed at the last meeting were just sort of case in point of the things that we do to try and make sure that we improve that. Councillor Walker. <coughs> yeah, it's certainly there in the... In the um, uh, we'll be there in the, in, in the minutes of the, um, the meeting that we have just um, had quite a broad meeting there discussing uh, development applications and their impacts um, on heritage. Um, but certainly, um, most recently, we have been engaging with the Youth, youth Advisory Group in regards to um, the Heritage Awards that, that, that the Heritage Council, uh, Heritage Council, the Heritage Committee um, helps to organise um, and getting some really useful feedback from that. Um, that committee because it is, uh, I suppose, you know, you'd like to sort of protect all heritage, but it is a matter of, um, of, of education and of reaching out to, yeah, to younger people, uh, perhaps people who are new to Launceston, and getting their responses um, and, and, and helping to educate the broader base of the community. Um, and the Heritage Awards are one way of doing that. And in, in, in engaging with um, the youth advisory group and, and hopefully in, in turn engaging with the broader youth of Launceston, uh, we can help to facilitate that process. So I do thank the, uh, the youth advisory group uh, for their input into that. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Walker. And for the benefit of the recording of those listening, Councillor Harris has just returned. Any other contributions? Councillor McKenzie, anything further from you? All those in favour, raise their hand. That is all councillors present. The motion is carried unanimously. Item 15, 15.1, concessional entry to council's waste disposal facilities. Moved Councillor Soward, seconded Councillor Spencer. Councillor Soward, do you wish to speak to the motion? Thanks very much, Acting Mayor. This is um, terrific. Uh, I would really hope that um, that uh, this gets the coverage it probably deserves. And I say that because I did a quick count, so I might, might have missed out one or so. But when you read through this particular item to provide concessions to approved charitable organisations for waste disposal, I did a quick count and counted 36 different... I'll be corrected if I'm wrong, I'm sure. 36 different organisations in our city who receive a benefit for doing the good work that they do and disposing of uh, waste. Now, Acting Mayor, when you read through the report, and it's an excellent report because what it does is it provides some provenance around how this process works. And the thing that it really captured my um, attention reading through it, it talks about the eligibility of organisations and uh, their... Uh, ATO exemption certificate, it, it takes, uh, takes through that, I won't repeat that. But the thing that really impressed me, Acting Mayor, all applicants must have submitted a detailed waste management reduction plan to be considered for this subsidy. So it's not just, here's a green light and a free pass, go and get rid of as much rubbish as you want to. It's saying to organisations, you need to do this in order to be considered eligible. I think that's wonderful. I might have said, I probably have said before, the biggest learning I had in the first year I was on council was how much it costs to get rid of rubbish. And I say that being funny, it seriously does. The, the amount of money it takes to build those cells at that tip to bury stuff. And this council, I'm pleased to say, Acting Mayor, has certainly moved on from those days and does some great work in the space. The last thing I want to say, just in closing my remarks, the report's very thorough. It explains what people are doing and all those sorts of things. If anyone ever says, and it's timely today, Acting Mayor, because like probably many people in the city, I got my rates notice. And if anyone says, oh, you know, the council doesn't do anything for me, have a look at this. These wonderful organisations, 30-plus of them, that does great work, I won't name them, they're all there, 
does great work helping people, supporting different causes. I mean, there's groups that support and work in the animal space, um, schools, uh, different community groups across the whole city, help vulnerable people. You know, that's where your rates go, part of where your rates go, to support the actions of these people in assisting them with some concessional waste disposal, but critically, only where they've shown that they have a detailed waste management reduction plan. So very happy to support it, uh, Acting Mayor. And again, I think uh, it's another example of where Council works with different groups on helping different people do really, really good things. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Councillor Soward. Councillor Spencer. Thanks, Acting Mayor. Um, I've got the privilege of being on this committee. Uh, myself and uh, Councillor Walker and myself assessed all this. And I must say, um, Mick and Jess did a wonderful job of going through all this. Absolutely brilliant. Made it easy for us. And uh, we went down to a uh, fine tooth comb with all this. So uh, we were pretty happy with the outcome. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Spencer. Councillor Walker. Yes, we are quite forensic in our um, approach towards this. Um, we do want to know um, if, if, if people's you know, waste, as uh, Councillor, Councillor Soward points out, we do want to see that people's um, waste is, is decreasing and that they are making efforts to find alternative solutions uh, to some of their waste issues. Now, of course, that doesn't, that, that, that's not easy for some of these organisations and I want to sort of extend on what Councillor Soward said because... Yes, of course, this is an obvious benefit where your, uh, your rate dollar goes to, but it's also a benefit that goes further than that. It goes, it goes to people who, um, you, know, are, uh, you know, when it comes to uh, certain charities, people who are looking, you know, for cheap, affordable goods or perhaps people who are finding themselves homeless or in need of some kind of service. Uh, you know, the benefits are broad and go beyond um, what you might, you know, initially think. Now, having said that, some of these organisations do struggle to get that reduced because they, in turn, uh, become a repository, if you like, uh, for people who, you know, uh, are looking to get rid of something that they no longer value and perhaps that service may long, no, no, not value as well. So there are still issues there. Um, and, but it is good to see, you know, some creative solutions that, that do come out of that. Um, but, you know, uh, I, I suppose a, a quick look at the numbers would probably spell out a lot of what I'm, I, I'm talking about for anyone who is interested um, to, to see uh, where those concessions are going to. And I suppose the other thing I would like to mention is, of course, that uh, with the statewide waste levy introduction, there will be impacts on these organisations because their concessions will be affected by that waste levy. So that's something that... Um, and as... Um, Councillor Spencer pointed out, uh, the, the, the council officers, um, Mick and Jess, do a wonderful job of, of keeping us across that and the impacts um, that that will have. And, and, and drilling down to quite a lot of detail that I could bore you with, but it is, um, you know, a, a, the more you look into it, the more fascinating it becomes. So um, I'm just... Um, Happy to say that we are providing that service and we are providing that education, that awareness um, throughout the community. And hopefully those organisations are then providing that to their, their base of their people, their, the, the users, the customers or, you know, the people who work with them. So that's how it works. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Walker. Any other contributions? Councillor Soward, anything further? Thanks, Acting Mayor. I just thank uh, Councillor Spencer and Councillor Walker for their work on that committee and uh, look forward to supporting those groups. Thank you. We'll put the vote. All those in favour, raise their hand. That is all councillors present. The motion is carried unanimously. We move to item 15.2. Councillor Daking, I believe you're declaring an interest in 15.2. Thank you. As you leave the room. Councillor Soward, 
momentarily stepping out. I remind councillors that this decision requires an absolute majority of council. Someone to move the motion. Councillor McKenzie and seconded Councillor Harris. Councillor McKenzie. We've got an absolute majority in the room. Just. Um, Look, um, I, I raise to, you know, to support uh, the motion that's put, been put for us to accept uh, the, uh, the price put forward by um, Tassie Builders. Um, what's happened over the process is well articulated in the, uh, in the decision statement, the recommendation as to why we've got here. Traditionally, we would go to a tender process, and we did. Uh, unfortunately, we weren't successful in getting any tenders. This project has been in our capital budget for at least two or three years um, and has been deferred for a number of reasons over that period of time. Um, and we've now got a situation where we've got a tender come in from Taz City Builders. It's been aligned back against our quantity surveyor, which is giving us some comfort that the numbers that we've been used are in accordance with what's a fair estimate for the work that needs to be done. Having said that, uh, I nearly took a very deep breath when I saw the number uh, as to what the cost of it was and when you consider what it is, but you've got to also understand these are facilities that are being built into an existing structure. Uh, we're in a heritage area, so therefore how this fits in with the structure that we work in, we need to make sure that the job actually is commensurate with the building that it's being built into if we're going to do it in this basis. So I sort of take all those sorts of things into consideration in making my uh, assessment of whether I think this is an appropriate project to go forward. Um, we've had lots of our people, our architect, look at it. We've had quantity surveyors. We've put tender projects out. We've gone back and negotiated in good faith, uh, and we can understand the reasons why uh, Tass City Builders might be available to do that. Um, I think, would I, in, in better times, I'd probably defer it unless we can get another tender later down the track. The reality of it is, I think this has been sitting on our to-do list for too long, and I think we owe it to the staff of our um, of our uh, organisation, uh, which uh, some 400. Uh, not that all 400 will get the use of it, but I think the end of trip facilities it sends a good message to our community about trying to get people to be more active and riding their bikes to work or even walking to work. It gets people the opportunity to go and exercise during lunch periods and come back and be able to get themselves ready for work in the afternoon at the very other stages during the day. If we were sitting there and approving a building for someone else, we would be making certain that end-of-trip facilities were part of that, that DA going forward. And I think this is something that's really important for our organisation. Thanks, Councillor McKenzie. We note that Councillor Sout has re-attended the meeting. Second, <coughs> Councillor Harris. Yeah, thank you, uh, Acting Mayor. Look, um, happy to support this motion. It, the motion before us is not whether we should or shouldn't do it. It's the fact that we're going outside our tender process, uh, and, uh, and that's because we couldn't get anyone to respond to our tender due to the construction industry uh, at the moment. And, in fact, in talking to a member of the construction industry just a couple of weeks ago, uh, he was saying that his order book is still many years at the large end of the scale um, in, in the type of market they work in. So I uh, congratulate the uh, council officer who took the initiative when they were aware that there would have been perhaps an opening of her in Taz City Building's uh, work schedule to see whether this could actually be picked up and done. And the fact that that has now come back uh, obviously more expensive than originally proposed in 2020, uh, but not by an exorbitant m m uh, number based on what has happened in the building industry. And as someone who's undergoing a bathroom renovation, uh, I can tell you that my bathroom renovation from uh, 10 years ago is now four times the number it was just 10 years ago. Um, and so that just gives an indication of what's happening in the building industry. Should we delay this project to try to wait for uh, uh, other tenderers and that, all what we'll be subjecting ourselves to will be, in fact, increased costings, in my opinion. Uh, so I was uh, happy to support the motion that we go outside the process <coughs> in this occasion and actually... Um, contract for Taz City Building to do the work. I know from personal experience, having ridden my bike to council, to council workshops and to council meetings, uh, no matter how slowly I try to ride, when I get here my body is overheating and having end of trip facilities is something that I will use. And uh, for those of you who walk, I'm sure you feel the same because once you do start to exercise, 
uh, the, the body will heat up and if, whilst on a day like today where it's pretty cool outside, you might not heat up so much, it's still something that will obviously happen. And of course in summer it is something that is much needed. And of course provides an increased amenity and uh, for our staff to get out and exercise as well, whether that be walking to work or in fact going for a run at lunchtime. These are things that make working for our City Council an attractive option. And in fact it's something that we as a council that is a large employer in the CBD should be shown to be leading the way and actually helping uh, other businesses to consider, even though they may not have to do it as part of their building, any renovations they should be considering such things. Uh, I was lucky enough to work in uh, Telstra where we generally had Commonwealth grade offices and that always included showers in the toilets. And uh, I must admit when I first went into uh, the office in Cameron Street and there was a shower in there, I thought what a waste we could have done with another toilet until we chose to do some exercising to go in the burning ten and we went running at lunchtime, at which point there was only one shower and we wished there was more. So I do think it is something that is, will be used by the staff and uh, I think it's time to just get on and get it done. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Harris. Councillor Soward. Thanks, Acting Mayor. I'm, I just... Uh, rise to support this and completely support the remarks of the previous speakers. I'm going to uh, not repeat anything they've said. I just want to pick up a point that uh, Councillor Harris made. When you dig into the health and wellbeing space, one of the reasons given for why people don't ride or ride to work is that there isn't that end of you know, facility, the ability to you know, have a shower and get changed at your workplace. So that's not just here. That's throughout the community. If you uh, undertake work or read any of the literature, it's a, it's a barrier. It stops people doing it, as uh, Councillor Harris provided with that very detailed and excellent example. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to go on a slightly different tact here, Acting Mayor. Even though I do agree with everything that's been said, I'm not going to repeat it. Um, for mine, uh, the really, really key thing in this um, item is the report itself, because what it does you know, it's none of this, oh, I heard a story from a bloke or I was talking to someone at the car wash. It's all there black and white why we have uh, discussing taking this tact. There aren't idle builders sitting around there looking for work. That's well known. It's explained very, very clearly in the report the process that we've undertaken so far. There isn't a secret deal or some sort of, you know, meet on the wharf at midnight arrangement. It's something that's spelled out very clearly why we're considering this in the way we're considering it today. And I think that is absolutely crucial. So I know there'll be a wonderful report written in the Examiner tomorrow. The papers are, are all there online. If people think, oh, I'm not too sure about that, I better, better check it out. A bit like the query we had today in an earlier item. You know, that's not what I've been told. Well, here it is. Here it is. Here's the facts. Here's the information, it's all there. And uh, I think that that's really, really important, Acting Mayor, because we're not just deciding to do this off the cuff. It's explained very clearly why that's happening. I also note, Acting Mayor, that some people no doubt out there, far wiser than me, but with no building qualifications, will go, oh, I could build it for half that. Well, that's fine. You didn't put a tender in back in when we were calling for tenders, so... Uh, I'm not interested in what you've got to say, sorry. Um, you know, I think there's far too much of that out there. Uh, you know, nothing's impossible if you don't have to do it. It's an old saying, isn't it? Nothing's impossible if you don't have to do it. So it's all there. It's all there in black and white. It all stands up to scrutiny. Uh, and again, uh, explains very clearly uh, on, on that. And I would direct anyone who had any queries, and I'm sure that there may be some that come out and some questions that might come to us, it's all there online where people can find the information. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Soud. Councillor Spencer. Thanks, Deputy. I'm a bit iffy with this one. Um, I don't know how urgent it is. I still would like to get other prices. I've always said that. We've asked these people to price it for us. Maybe we should have asked someone else. My phone the last month's down 15 or 20 per cent. Work is not that crazy. It will slow down, believe me. Job ads, I found out this morning, are 4 or 5 per cent down. So time will change, believe me. Um, 
I've got a question. Is any other councillors in the state given $554,000 out without asking the question by, by a couple of other builders to say, what can you do that for? When can you do it? That's my main concern. Um, I, I know it's going to benefit the people here. It's going to benefit me. But is it urgent? So we put rates up. People will say, oh, you put rates up and you're building half a million dollar shower block. Is it urgent? Probably not. Thank you. The answer to your question, CEO. So there are, there are a few questions in there. So maybe recap them. So one was, are other councils... So what was the question? So you need to remember that the project did go to tender. Yes. So that's important to, to recognise. So, and obviously it's explained there was an opportunity that we saw that was presented through um, undertaking a, another tender process that has fallen through, that we, we identified an opportunity. So I don't know whether other councils are acting, are acting in the agile way that, that this you know, that this, this is. Um, it wouldn't be fair to say that we haven't tested the market and it wouldn't be fair to say that we haven't um, derived at a price that we, we think um, delivers fair value. So, um, so I think um, in answer to the question, I can only talk to what our council is doing I, and I can't really tell you what other councils are doing, but certainly um, this is, is um, done with propriety and is certainly an, an innovative and an agile way to, to deal with what is a, a problem confronting our industry. In terms of the urgency of it, I would say that it is. Um, we, we've got a, a workplace servicing 270 people. Um, we have a need to be able to facilitate people to be able to access work in different ways than using their motor vehicles. Um, we've done survey work that has shown that if we were to provide the, the facilities that we would have more people ride their bike or work, walk to work and certainly um, there are quite a few that do now and suffer the suffer the, the lack of facilities that, that we currently have. So I, I would say that it is an urgent need, um, given that you know we, we've battled away without it for, for quite a significant period of time. Any further questions, Councillor Spencer? Question, Councillor Walker. Thank you, uh, Chair. Um, we, we say that we have had this budgeted for quite a number of years, so three or four years at least. Um, how much was that budget figure originally? Has that changed over that period of time? Um, is that possible to answer that? It, the amount that was originally budgeted and, and whether that's changed? Mr Gimple, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. I um, don't know the exact figures, but it's definitely gone up. It was probably incorporated in an entire town hall project, so it would have been part of that, but... Yeah, everything's escalated. Evaluations this year have gone up considerably just from independent valuations. It's based on cost of replacement. So it's not surprising. Thank you. Another question. Um, someone was mentioning the idea that, you know, if there was a commercial build in the CBD now that they would, you know, reasonably um, be expected to provide these services. But I'm not aware if anyone can um, elucidate further what the planning scheme does require in regards to, um, I mean, of course, uh, you know, cycle racks, you know, certainly part of, you know, parking requirements on a given size, but, but uh, end of trip facilities, is that something that's required for a, a commercial building or a, what would you say, a business district building? CEO, is that... Certainly there, there are requirements that have been introduced in my time that didn't used to be requirements, so in terms of vehicle parking for bikes and, and those sorts of things. So in terms of end-of-trip facilities, I don't know is the short answer whether that is a requirement for a new commercial building. It's certainly becoming more and more common. So, for instance, you know, the CH Smith redevelopment that was relatively you know, recently has, has, in, has included um, end-of-trip facilities as part of that because it's, it's what... Um, I guess a more contemporary and modern workplace is demanding, but I would need to get back to you in respect of what the planning scheme says, other than I definitely know it requires parking for bikes to be provided. So. Thanks, CEO. Any further questions, Councillor Walker? Question from Councillor Harris. 
I perhaps just might answer Councillor Walker's question just with my own knowledge and pose as a question uh, to the CEO. Um, the green building at 113 Cimetier Street, which was developed a few years ago, that certainly had end of, tra uh, end of trip facilities as part of its redevelopment uh, that I'm aware of, and I'm pretty sure there was end of trip facilities provided in the new building we approved for St Luke's, Luke's Health. Um, and so to end it as a question, I'll say, uh, isn't that right, someone? <laughs> Apparently so. Councillor Walker. Thank you, Deputy. And I too, as uh, similar to Councillor Spencer, do have some um, you know, misgivings about this. Um, it's certainly, I fully accept, you know, the desire, you know, you could say the need uh, for these uh, facilities. Um, it's, it's, you know, it does not need explaining uh, that we should be, you know, it's, it's part of our policy that we are wanting to uh, encourage less um, reliance on personal transport in the term, uh, in, in the form of vehicles, cars, um, and that we are encouraging, you know, people to exercise and all those sort of things. Um, for me, the difficulty surrounding this it's partially, um, you know, the, 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 the temper of the times has changed since this idea initially uh, had its gestation you know, four plus years ago, only insofar as our, uh, our economic situation has changed. Certainly the desire for these things hasn't changed, it's probably increased. And I fully sympathise with um, council staff um, who, who would like to have such a facility, as would many people who work in the CBD who probably don't have that facility either. So, in actual fact, you know, there could be a possibility where, um, you know, council could facilitate uh, a facility like this that would be shared between council workers and, uh, you know, CBD workers. You know, uh, there, there are other um, ways of approaching this. Of course, that's not what we have on the table in front of us. So, we, we have really just a decision to make about a, a financial process, a financial decision-making process, really, um, which convolutes the matter if we start talking about the, the, um, the purpose for which that, um, that um, money is being allocated. Um, I would like to think uh, that, you know, we talk about being an agile council, and this idea's been around for four years. Um, I would like to think that Economically speaking, we know that at the moment there is high demand for builders. There is a shortage of materials. We don't know what it's going to be like in six or eight months' time. It could cost 15% less. It could cost 15% more. That's something that none of us can actually say. But what we do know at the moment is that we are in a cycle that is inflationary, um, that is putting pressure um, on the ability of local... Uh, firms to be able to, uh, com you know, competitively compete for things like tenders, something that we know we would normally follow that process, uh, in that competitive process, to get the best value uh, for ratepayers' dollars in, in things like this. So that's essentially what we're talking about today. Um, I don't think anyone disagrees that this is a, a great thing uh, for... As the CEO says, 270 staff in these buildings. That's a lot of people. That's, we are one of the, you know, if not, I, I think the biggest employer in the CBD. Um, if you don't include the hospital, it's not quite in the CBD. So, um, so there you go. It's, it's entirely reasonable. So for me, it does come down to this question as to whether we're getting the best value um, for our money. At the moment, that is the only value that we can get for our money. As there is no other choice. That makes it a difficult decision. Um, and so I can sympathise with Councillor Spencer in that way. Um, I, I do believe, I think we all know, the economic cycles, they do come and go. Things will probably never be as cheap as they once were. They probably won't be as expensive as they have been. Um, but we are making a decision here about uh, one particular quote um, in it in a moment in time when there is no other choice and materials and labour, there is a shortage. Um, so that's the question for all of us. I hope I've uh, you know, elaborated on 
that sort of difficulty that I, uh, I'm sure other people appreciate. And um, as I sit down, I'm still not quite sure which way I'm going to vote. Thank you, Councillor Walker. Are there any other contributions? Councillor Spencer, another question? I would just like to ask, thanks, um, Deputy. Uh, well, the LGH has probably got five, six hundred workers. Have they got showers? Um, well, Krista probably can answer this for the uh, workers. You have? Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Walker. <laughs> Councillor McKenzie, do you wish to close? I, I do. And th thanks, everyone, for the contribution. And I can understand some of the comments that have been made. I think it's important to understand we have been through a process. We've been through a, through a proper process. We have budgeted to do this over a number of years. So we have an undertaking to our staff to do this. Uh, and it's been bumped down the road a couple of times. So therefore, there's some issues associated with what we've undertaken to take in for our staff. In relation to Councillor Spencer going out getting another project, I can tell you I'm involved in another commercial enterprise at the moment where we've done just this because we couldn't get tenders for it. We've actually sat down, we've done our uh, plan of works and we're negotiating an, an arrangement for somebody to build, to build a facility for us uh, without having several projects. So we've had to get one builder to get in because the reality is in this market you won't get another builder to come out and say, well, I'll go and tender this process or I'll come and work it through with you, because they say, we're too busy, I think is the reality of it. I think we have an undertaking. Um, I think it's been well set out in the papers, uh, brought back to us for consideration in regards to it, and I believe we owe it to our staff. I believe the price is as good as we're going to get, and as Councillor uh, Walker said, we don't know what the price might be in six or 12 months' time. Uh, I think if we sit there and worry about that, it's probably going to cost us more, ultimately, in some way or another. So my view is we've got somebody who's got the time and the opportunity to do this work for us now. We've undertaken to do this over a number of years. It's now time to deliver. Thanks, Councillor McKenzie. No questions after closing. So we'll put the motion. All those in favour, please raise their hand. Those against? Those abstaining? So it's lost. There was hesitation there. I'm happy to take the vote again. All those in favour, please raise their hand. Those against? Those sitting on the fence. So Councillor Walker and Councillor Spencer, therefore the motion <coughs> is lost. Item 16, closed council. A motion to move into closed council. Thank you, Councillor Soward. Councillor Daking re enters the room, seconded by Councillor Harris. All those in favour raise their hand. It is all councillors present. We now move into closed council.
Sabbath. 